losing builds character and I say, so does winning. Like, give me the winning any day and that the losing feeling suck. When you add emotion to anything, let alone sport, it just changes the game, which is why the Olympics gives such an amazing X factor to performance. But I imagine when you walk up Everest and you get to the top, you don't realize you've got to walk bloody back down the thing, right? Yeah. So, so I always imagine walking up Everest, I've got no problem, but then getting helicoptered out. Yeah. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Nail It and Scale It, the world's leading fast growth program for businesses. If you have ever wanted to grow your business faster than what you can right now, if you need to make more revenue, if you need more leads, if you need more clients, if you need to know how to plan your business in a strategic way in order to hit big goals, if you need to learn how to scale your business and grow your team and your business so that you have more freedom, then this program is for you. Imagine three days immersed with me where we cover all aspects of business, but we do it from an immersive but also an execution standpoint. We execute every step of the way and we're looking at five key areas we're looking at your psychology we're looking at your marketing your sales your leadership and we're looking at your planning and how we integrate these five key areas to grow your business and your brand quickly so if you'd like to find out more information kerwinray.com so ladies and gentlemen is my great pleasure to welcome to unstoppable the i don't want to say the corona edition because i don't want to date the material but the reality is we're in isolation <laughs> natalie cook how are you? Nat? Which is which is why we're not hugging on the couch. Oh, we're Kerwin, hugging, that's, baby. We're hugging. We're, 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 we're virtual hugging. Yeah, yeah, we are, uh, mate. It's so good to see you on the screen. I missed you a lot. Oh, um, the, well. But that when the hugging returns, we will embrace. We'll hug it out. We'll make up for lost time. Um, <laughs> well, listen, it's great to have you on on the show. But uh, yeah, look, I guess for people who don't know who you are. How do you answer that question at a dinner party? I'm always curious to know how people answer this question because, you know, everyone knows you as the Olympic gold medalist and, you know, Natalie Cook, the, the beach volleyballer. But I'm curious to know when you're at a dinner party and someone doesn't know you or at a barbecue, and they say, so what do you do? Like, how do you answer that question? Yeah, well, that's interesting because the who are you is very different to what do you do, right? Yeah. So that too, totally, depending on what people ask. But sometimes I like to make fun and uh, just make up something random like an astronaut because I was sitting at a New Year's Eve party once and someone yeah, someone said, oh, Natalie Cook, the gold medalist is here. And my this my now mate, Rob Nixon, walked in and said, you might have a gold medal, but I'm going to space with Richard Branson. I was like, oh. <laughs> so it became a real, like, you show me yours and I'll show you mine and mine's bigger. So it, when people say, you know, what do you do? Um, I mean, now it's changed and evolved over the last 20 years. It's my 20-year anniversary of an Olympic gold medal this wow. year. Wow. So, you know, it, it's a 20-year, 20 25 years as an athlete, 20 years now post the big success uh, that you can only dream of. Um, so now I've got many, many roles uh, and, and my coach likes to call me a statesman. He thinks I've now go, gone past that, you know, you go from that snotty-nosed kid and the one that, selfish athlete that deserve, thinks they deserve everything into, you know, trying to now protect all the other athletes, right? Um, so In the same situation. I, oh, yeah, like yeah. and st oh, stand up for the athletes and, and how do we get them involved in recovery packages for corona, all of those things. Yeah, so, nice. Uh, what do I do? Bloody hell, don't so, know the answer to that. Look, the way I best describe you, I met you when you were working as an ass model for Calvin Klein. It was a great shoot. Because um, <laughs> was really you were there phenomenal. too, right? I was, yeah, of course yeah. I was. Hello. If you saw Hello. me walking backwards, no, you wouldn't be asking that question. <laughs> but um, look, I think it's, it's fair to say uh, you and I know each other quite well. Like we first met, I'm trying to remember, I actually reminded you of this last time we spoke. Uh, it was in... Gosh, don't quote me. It was Sports sports Power, uh, Mount Gravatt, Garden City. <laughs> now, I'm going to go, this has got to be like 90-something. Six. 96. 95, actually. 95, yeah. 95, 96. Mm -hmm. I was managing the store there. And you and I, and again, I know you. this is a little bit hazy for you, but I remember it very clearly because you were <laughs> Natalie Cook. Uh, and I think at the time you were the bronze medalist from memory. Is that right? And, well, um, that, yes. So that yep. was 96. So it had to be yep. 96. Yep. So at that I, point you were the bronze medalist. Yeah. And then, and I'd been playing at this point. Um, no, actually I hadn't. It was this that actually got me into it. I had always had an interest at school in volleyball and you and I played volleyball in Garden City for, I think you were there for one or two days. 
And you and I, you taught me how to, you know, to basically set and pike and all the bits and pieces in a, in a shopping center. Now, I don't know if you know this, but I went on to play three seasons of beach. I think I did tell you three seasons of beach volleyball in Brisbane as a result. Um, C grade. I just pitched yeah. out to my old teammate, uh, Scott, can't remember your last name. Teammate was Ducks Nuts and we fucking rocked <laughs> out. We, 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 were the, we, were, we were king of the C grade. But um, that was a big memory for me because, you know, you talk about mentoring, you talk about shepherding. And I remember at that time, you know, this is pre-entrepreneur for me. This is, I just come out of the security industry um, and, um, you know, you, you, you took me under your wing at a, at a shopping center and showed me how to pike a ball. It was, it was quite, do you remember, you still don't remember that, do you? No, I do remember. And the yeah. more you talk about it, the more emotive it gets. And uh, <laughs> I'll correct you there as a, it's called a spike, Kerwin. So spike, clearly spike, just the, spike, hell. that's right. Really, no, that's your, that's you your diving career. Injuries, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that's all good, I but I, remember, I don't know. I don't know how many of us, how many we wiped out at the shopping centre trying to dig, set yeah. and spike, but we had a good time. We and we've been mates time. ever since. I've ever been watching since. your ever your since. climb and your rise to Kerwin Rayism. It's amazing. Kerwin Rayism. So, listen, I, I want to go where people have never gone to before, um, but let's go there. Like, where did you grow up? Like, where were you born? Up north. I was a Townsville um, born and uh, my grandma and granddad were from Ayr, A-Y-R, yeah. so yep. go look that up. It's about an hour south of Townsville in the Burdekin. And um, my dad was English. He was a semi-professional football player for Crystal Palace. And back in the day, not today where he would have made oodles of money, but uh, back in the day where he probably got his pub meal paid for and his Indian curry. Uh, and uh, my mum was an sw infant swim teacher. So we, we grew up in Townsville and I was taught to swim very early. Um, where mum wanted to did you grow up? I went to Heatley Primary. So okay. I grew up at, at Heatley next to the did long... Did you know I, I went to Cranbrook Primary? Yeah. <laughs> so mate, we are kindred spirits. <laughs> I was uh, the Townsville days were, you know, the old thick BMX bike and you'd yeah. ride down the shops and you'd get your 50 cents worth of lollies and your dollars worth of hot chips and, and uh, you know, some locals would steal your bike and then you'd have to chase the bike. Yeah. <laughs> you'd have to steal it back from someone else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, I yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah, so and I so did you my went primary to Hitley. School. You did primary? Yeah, yeah, go on. Primary there and then Dad uh, was an engineer and he got a job transfer to Brisbane. So up we up, uproot the and family. Was and eleven was it? Uh, last year of primary school, so year seven. I would have been. Yeah. Oh, we got here for Expo eighty eight. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so I would have been in thirteen. Okay, and at that point, had sports kind of started to develop as a as a bit of a a pattern of interest in your life. Yeah, I was swimming through the right. uh, through my mum's um, evolution. I was swimming up and down the black line, and I was the under eight state champion in the breaststroke. And yeah, you know, right. all, I did not know this. <laughs> From a young age, I yeah. was um, doing pretty good in swimming. And then we, when we moved, I, I also rode a BMX bike. And back then they called the girls in BMX, they called us powder puffs. <laughs> uh, so I, where they come up with these random names. So I think I quit that because I didn't want to be a powder puff. And, um, and then swimming kind of kept evolving and I kept winning. And, of course, when you win, you want to do more because you feel better. And um, then we moved to Brisbane and the swimming pool uh, going from the swimming pool to school, I went to Corinda High, um, where, like you all day. So you're there at 6 a.m., you smell like chlorine all day at school, you eat your cereal out of a, a dog's bowl and you go to school and then you go back to the pool and by the time you get home, you're exhausted. So I thought this wasn't very good. I had to find a new sport. Yeah, right. And so then you, how did you find beach? Well, it started indoor volleyball. So most people would have played at least a term of indoor volleyball at school, grade eight usually, and everyone's probably got PTSD from your arms being sore because that's what happened. Or your knees getting skinned on the Skin? basketball court bitumen? Yeah, yeah, bitumen. Or, or the oh. bitumen. We, we oh. played on a oh, bitumen and the, oh. the poles, the pole for the net was in a, a tyre, concreted into a tyre, and you'd roll the thing out. And uh, grade eight volleyball. So no one could play. It was like uh, the ball would go left and right, never went over the net. It hit you in the back of the head. It was the worst played sport ever at school when I started. And that's what attracted me. It was like this is the only sport I couldn't do. I could do everything else. I could swim and run and basketball and, and um, even taekwondo. And I tried everything. 
uh, even a sport called Vigoro, which was like girls' cricket back then. Before oh my god, became... I remember the Vigoro bats. Oh my god, <laughs> yeah, like, like I literally paddle. just had a, <laughs> I just had a part of my brain become active that has been dormant for forty three years. Oh my god. Vigoro, oh, I don't know wow. Vigoro. Yeah. And uh, and you used to peg the ball, and the mm. ball was quite hard, and I'd peg it. I'd leave welts on the girls' legs, and no one would want to come to bat. <laughs> so we'd win by default, mm. and the vigor teacher thought I was just the greatest thing, and I was, you know, very uh, aggressive as an athlete, and I won at everything. And um, there was a notice on the school notice board about sort of an A4 size, this is community school notice board. It was paper back then, right? doesn't happen digitally. And it said, I was in grade nine, and it said volleyball trip to Canada and America. And so I raced upstairs to the PE department to my PE teacher. I said, what's volleyball? And he took me by the hand, walked me down to the school indoor hall and said, that's volleyball. And the rest is history. Disneyland and Canada for the mountains. And I fell in love with it. Wow. And so you played indoor for how long at this point? Uh, well, grade through grade nine, ten, eleven, yeah. through the end of high school. And so, did you and then, did you aspire and achieve? Because obviously, this is a team sport now. Like you, you're used to competing, you know, in solo yes. sports. How did you go in that transition from being a solo competitor to being a team competitor? I did not play well with others. I was <laughs> <laughs> aggressive. <laughs> I made many of my teammates cry. Um, I was named captain of a school team that went to South Australia and just because I was good and all I did was make the girls cry and, and they'd run into the to the change room and my coach would say, go on, you're the captain, go and sort them out. I said, I can't. I sent them in there so I can't <laughs> help them. Oh, and, dear. you know, I didn't like sharing the indoor volleyball with six aside. You meant you didn't touch the ball as often and I didn't like sharing the ball. So I was like a dog that ran around and ran over people. Um, you know, not very proud of it, and I can laugh about yep. it now. But yeah, no, I can't um, relate at all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so so uh, that's how I start, and that's why the jump to beach volleyball was so easy. Yeah, it's like, okay. of course, I touch the ball every second time. I don't have a coach telling me what to do. I travel around the world on the best beaches, but that transition didn't happen until 1993. So at right. this point, I'm eight, 18, okay, and beach. Beach volleyball gets announced as the first time in the Olympic Games in 1996, and it's like yeah, right. <gasps> the right place at the right time. Right time, yep. Wow. But and I so- wasn't. I mean, I, I was only 18, and there was there were two girls in Australia playing beach volleyball, and they were travelling the world. And right. um, all you won when you won a beach volleyball tournament in Australia, you won a, a water bottle and a hat. Right. Right. That's about it. Yep. And they decided when the announcement happened, the best way to get a medal would be to split because they were small and they wanted a taller, younger player each so they could try and field two teams. So they went on, you know, a bit like an entrepreneurial yeah. pitch challenge, right? Wow. They went looking. They went looking for the next thing. And I remember it was at Mount Cravat at the um, QE2 Stadium yeah. Volleyball Hall and there was a tournament of 17, 18-year-olds. And and now she, I remember her sitting up in the corner watching us all. And uh, I was the one, she came and said, I love your attitude. Uh, would you like to go to the Olympics? Are you fucking, and this is, are you serious? <laughs> At this point you haven't touched sand? No, nah, never played on the sand, didn't even know it was a sport. And what year was this, 93? 93. And 96 and is when the Olympics? Yep. And she said, you got to move to Sydney yeah. and I'm in Brisbane. I've gone from yeah. Townsville to Brisbane. I've got a feathered nest. My mum does everything. She's got a magic washing machine, a magic <laughs> dinner table. Yeah. You know, er- everything is taken care of and I've got to move to Glebe in Sydney. Yeah, right. right. I just, um, so I was studying physiotherapy. I was thinking that was going to be my career and I was going to be a physiotherapist. And uh, so I had to... I, First time she asked me, I actually said no. I said, my dad wants me to get my degree. He wants me to go to university and finish the physiotherapy degree And because beach volleyball is really just like lawn bowls, right, so no one's going to care. And um, so I said no. And so it took about two weeks of me kind of hitting my head against the wall and waking up every morning going, this is my dream. What am I thinking and I called her back and said, have you found someone else? Because you only need one other, right? She could have picked up the phone, called someone else. And she said, no, I haven't found anyone 
that I want to play with. So I said, great, well, I'm flying to Sydney tonight. See you soon. Wow. And uh, left my feathered nest. How old were you in 93? 18. 18, okay. And so you moved to Sydney. Yeah. And so what happened then? How did you – because I'm going to assume feathered nest, didn't need to necessarily have a job, you're studying physiotherapy, you've got magic magic resources, you moved to Sydney. I'm, I'm sensing a bit of a culture shock coming on. What happened? Oh. Uh, well, I lived with my volleyball partner who at the time was married to the indoor volleyball coach and they lived with the general manager of volleyball and his <laughs> wife. So it was like it was like oh. some bad movie. And it was a three story townhouse in Glebe. Wow. And I walked to Glebe Point Road to get my food um, daily. Uh, and I lived on the top floor and ultimately I ran out of money. I couldn't afford to eat at the local uh, Italian restaurant, which is not good for your health, right? Lasagna and ossobuco and bread and pasta, which I found out I was allergic to and I swelled every time right. I'd eat it. So not good look in a bikini. So I'd run downstairs and I'd say to them, where are you going for dinner? Because these are all, I was 18 and they're all 30 and they're going uh, and they're getting paid. They're yeah. getting paid by the volleyball, they're the coach and they're right. getting paid and I, so I'd say, oh, I can't afford it. And he'd go, come on, I'll pay for you. And I'll toddle off, I'd go. <laughs> um, and, then, and then we won um, some money. Our first international event was in Brazil and we came fourth and we won 4000 US dollars and I thought this was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And that was the start in uh, wow. November 1994. 94, you won $4,000 at, what was that, in Brazil? In Brazil. Yeah, right. Against the best in the world, and we came fourth, and I'd never played before. It was like, how does this happen? So how do you remember – do you remember the feeling like when you first stood on the stand for the first time in a competition environment, not playing on the sand before? And do you remember like just thinking what was running through your head? Well, I remember feeling like a giraffe on roller skates and, and like in quicksand, like this is yeah. – and we see it now. Most teenage girls that go from indoor volleyball to the beach are conscious of their body. That was another thing because we had to wear a bikini. And it, it, the conditions make it so hard with the sand, the sun, the wind, uh, and there's only two of you instead of six covering mm. the same size court, right? So, so many different variables. Uh, but I love the freedom of the outdoors. I love the freedom of two people and not standing in a herd of 12 to go on an international volleyball trip. It's a very socially um, responsible sport when you think about it. Like, I know, it's social distancing. As long as you don't <laughs> high five, you have to You're keep fine, a 10 right? metre gap. That's right. <laughs> but I, I, the biggest thing I remember, like the coach happened to be, because we couldn't pay a coach, so of course it had to be my partner's husband who was an indoor volleyball coach. And if, if anyone knows Manly Beach in Sydney and the rock wall, that's up against the volleyball courts. Um, so imagine like a four or five metre wall behind you and the coach got really upset that I kept falling over. So if you ma- the ball gets hit really hard and then I land backwards and he's trying to get me to lean into this ball. I remember it vividly, right, lean into this ball. And I just kept freaking out and leaning backwards. So he said, stand up against that wall. So anytime you let back, you'd whack your head on this freaking stone wow. wall. I know the wall, so, yeah. That that was my introduction to how to learn to move forward at the ball. You're better off getting hit in the face than whacking your head against the wall. So yeah. there was some uh, hardcore training techniques that were going on back then. But you've got to admit, a three-year transition f- between picking up a new aspect of the sport to then competing at Olympic level, I'm curious as to how you're able to fit so much into such a short period of time, even just to go from 93 to 94, come for- fourth. Was that at the Worlds, did you say, in Brazil? Yeah, World Cup event. World yeah. Cup. That's 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 that's. that's I'm going to assume you've got you had a pretty strong base level at this point. But was it a pretty much smooth sailing from there? Did you just keep going from strength to strength to strength until you hit the uh, the games in '96? Well, when I think about it now, it felt like that. But there were so many. You know, when you're a professional athlete, we often lose more than we win, mm. right? Which is part of. But my brain had been trained over the time to forward focus. So I'd always look forward, always look to how we were going to win, even if we lost, um, how we're going to win the next game. So it was always about building on, you know, the coach, our new coach 
So when we get to Atlanta, we've got a new coach, an American guy called Steve Anderson, who was just amazing. Um, and I, he was with me for four Olympic Games over 16 years. And uh, it, so he became very influential in that um, process of forward facing and learning, you know, this whole, you don't lose, you learn. Mm, well, you're the winner. Um, learn. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that whole, which is a big wank. Believe me. <laughs> you know, they say they say losing builds character to you know, losing builds character. And I say, so does winning. Like, give me the winning any day and that the losing feeling sucked. And I I remember being in it a lot back then as we we're evolving. We would always finish sort of fourth or fifth and fourth or, and not on the medals. The medals were Brazil or America. And so it just kept like aspiring, aspiring to want to get on the podium. And, and we'd say to the coach, oh, I just can't, what's going wrong? What are we doing wrong? This sucks. Nothing you're teaching us works. We'd, go, we'd blame him, right? Perfect thing to do. Get outside yourself and blame him. And he's like, you're on track. You're doing everything right. I said, bullshit. Like I'd call him bullshit all the time. And, and he must have had a longer term, clearly, a longer term vision in play as, as athletes were very emotive. Um, and as you get older and more mature, you bring that grace to result. But when you're 17, 18, 19 and you, you want to win, mm. it, it's pretty primitive and pretty ugly. So there, there were many a fights, not only with your volleyball partner but with the coach. And uh, how, um, how, how did you find during that period managing your ego? Because, you know, you see that with a lot of young professional athletes as they start to really enter their peak, pre-Olympics, maybe post-Olympics. But I'm curious from your perspective, because I know you've done a lot of work on yourself. You know, you're, you're quite a conscious, mindful person. But when you reflect now, were you aware of what was building within you in terms of you know, learning how to manage this personality that was beyond just Natalie? Yeah, I, I definitely had my identity wrapped up in being the beach volleyballer. That yeah. that was definitely what I was and, and my performance uh, on and off the court reflected me. And I guess that's how I learned to... Uh, be graceful in defeat because yeah. it didn't. When you saw others kick balls and throw things and do what I wanted to do, you yeah. know, it's like a toddler, toddler throwing a tantrum. You had learned poise and and grace to do that, and and I learned through watching others not do it right yeah. and saying I don't want to, I don't want to look like that. That's pretty ugly. Um, but it, that was the evolution of how do I want to, how do I match my performance with my personality mm. because sometimes you see athletes um, hold back their personality, trying to hold a face that they should be showing. So how do you be emotive? Because Kerry and I, which was my most successful partnership, were two very different people. So mm. I liked I like to orchestrate the crowd and play with the crowd and talk to the crowd and Kerry really had to be like tunnel vision. And so we had to learn most of the the learning was how how we let each other be each other, Ooh, um, and that's how big. we uh, and how we press how do I press her button to help her perform better without sacrificing my performance? Because mm. it's all when you get your head in someone else's game, and you it, 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 this became the most challenging part. I think this is why we won ultimately, is we worked on the emotional management way before that became a thing, mm. right? So that's what I learned in my self-development and, and through travelling the world on your own. There's two of us or, or three with a coach if we could afford him back then. Um, you you got to manage a whole business of sport, which is the, the off-court and the on-court, your performance, your results, because if you didn't win, you didn't make any money. If you didn't make any money, you couldn't bring the coach. If you didn't bring the coach, you got worse. This whole, I don't know if I answered any of your bloody question. but No, that, you did. <laughs> but what I'm curious to know, you know, because I, I, I feel so privileged. Like not only did, am I, did I, I was thinking about all the things that we've done. Like first time I played volleyball with you, we did our first skydive together. Oh, I did my first skydive with you. I don't know if you remember. I did my first fire walk with you. I don't know if you remember that. But <laughs> yes, I, I do. Yeah. Like and we've been through a lot, you know, like mm -hmm. from a distance. Like I know we've had. Um, you know, moments, but I'm curious as to, from my journey, I've observed as you've grown, like I remember actually from memory now it was 95, it was pre bronze medal, I think at Mount Gravatt, cause I'm, I'm pretty sure it was pre Curic or it was pre that. Mm. I remember watching the bronze medal. I remember seeing you celebrate 
So from memory now, I think it was 95. But I just remember watching you go through those heights and in many ways watching you find yourself. Do you know what I mean? And I'm curious to know your side of that journey and because I didn't get to see anything, everything. I, I didn't see anything in the scheme of things. I saw from a distance you rising to these great heights, this incredible success story. But I'm curious at any point, did you fall victim to like other athletes and did you lose yourself in the medals or the the persona, um, you know, and at, at any point, you know, lose who you were in the whole mm. of the sport? I, I don't think so at that point because I might have post winning the the gold medal. So okay. in in that, let me, climb, ask that question, let me ask that question in a broader terms. In the in in the spectrum of that of the whole of the whole story, have you ever yeah. lost yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I think after we won the Olympic gold medal, so you come third, you have right. all these aspirations of winning yeah, at home. Right. Let's go there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is where it gets interesting because okay. you. Let's- you, when you go to the Olympic Games, it's pretty amazing. To go once yeah. is amazing. To wear the green and gold, to go any more than that, like to go to a second one and then win at home. So a medal is great. Winning is great. Winning at home um, in a sport that's very low profile. And and Kerry and I made the sport, right? So Kerry Pothas and Natalie Cook are synonymous with beach volleyball and its success in Australia. And I often get Kerry get called Kerry all the time, right? I'm like, and people will yell across the street, Kerry, Kerry, and I'll I'll, I'll ignore them partly because it's not my name but partly because I know what's going on and I'll turn across the street and go, it's the other one, the better looking one. Like, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, when we won the gold medal and you get put on a stamp and you become thrown into the spotlight, there's only one of 16 Olympic gold medals from the Sydney 2000 Olympics, uh, and and everybody kind of knows who you are for a while. Mm. Um, it, we stopped training as much. We we were out doing appearances because that's where we made the money, right? We mm. were getting paid to appear. It would take me three volleyball tournaments to win what I would get paid to appear at a function. Talk wow. about it. Right? So so then it's like, oh, let's keep appearing and let's keep being paid, and we didn't train. So, oh, it should be right. Well, we're the gold medalists, right? Surely we can keep winning. But this is when the shock comes right. that um, you think all the work you got to get there, you think you can just palm. That's where the ego comes in. I'm good enough. I'm the Olympic gold medalist. We're going to be okay. Um, and it doesn't really happen like that. You kind of get hit in the head with something. And at that time for me, it was an injury. We're unbeaten, no reason to be injured. Well, Maybe as I talk about it, maybe there was because we weren't yeah. training. Wow. The, 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 what was the, the injury? Wasn't, a quad, a quad tear. Which quad, left or right? Uh, my left. Left. Turning off the net. Yeah, right. Just something where you do every day. But yeah. um, and the emo- of course the emotional overlay, and I've learnt um, how emotion gets trapped in organs, and how yeah. you know all of that. Comes left leg out feminine, and, left leg's feminine, represents strength, uh, feminine strength, uh, moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, all of those things. And I yeah. didn't, there was there was actually a fear when you win at that level and become the best in the world, there's a fear of, oh, my God, we've got to keep doing this. Mm. So in hindsight, I look back and think maybe I hurt myself on purpose so I didn't have the expectation Ooh. of having to keep winning. Right? Because wow. then you got to, wow. yeah, yeah, a whole Oh, it's hard. It's hard to say sometimes. Yeah, um, no, but I hear it, you. Um, it was so long ago, but but you've got then the pressure of Kerry going. Well, I have to. You have to be physically right for me to play with you. Yeah. So she she sat out on the sideline while I've now got this injury, and we're traveling around Europe with me with a hobbly leg, and for a year of this oh. is our post Olympic gold medal year, which we should be in our glory, right? So this is where I noticed the the ego got a little bit big. I then got injured, and then that brought it all back down pretty quick. And um, we kind of lost a bit of that momentum. And then Kerry retired because she wanted a family. So our partnership split up. And the, yeah, there's a lot a lot in there. But um, we actually split up between '96 and 2000 right. uh, for two for a year and a half, which was. Okay. Uh, a soul searching moment. You come off a bronze medal. You've set all these goals of of what you want to do in 1997. The next year, we're going to be world champions. We're going to win because you come from third. The next step is second and first, right? 
And, of course, we go from third to 17th in our next year um, and lots of blame and lots of swear words and, and, and so we split up. And that was when I really found Curic, Ashley, the firewalker. Yeah, right. And uh, he was doing, a, a, ironically, his seminar was called Unstoppable. Was so, it really? <laughs> yeah. oh, so goodness. he was doing an Unstoppable tour in 1997 yeah. and I was sitting in the front row. He didn't know who I was. Um, right. who, I didn't tell him. No, who'd know who, no one would know who I was. But beach volleyball bronze medalist, that was my title. And he said, nobody remembers who comes second or third at the Olympics. Was that the Gold Coast event? Was that at the Gold Coast at? Um... Uh, no, Wool and Gabba okay. in this tiny little room. Oh, gosh. That was, a, that was his cell. That was his cell into the firewalk. Right, gotcha. And the firewalk was at the Gold Coast. Yep, okay. And uh, he said, no one remembers who comes second or third at the Olympics. And I still, it's like a vacuum. I go into this. <clears throat> it's like, what do you mean? That's my whole life. I've just come third at the Olympics. That's pretty fucking good. What are you doing? Like this is going on in my head and he's continuing, whatever he's continuing to say, I didn't hear. And afterwards I went up and shook his hand. I said, hi, Kirik, I'm Natalie Cook, bronze medalist at the Olympics. And he just sort of, ooh. <laughs> He tried to backpedal and then we went on to have an amazing relationship and he was there side by side in my personal growth journey, mm. um, uh, making me parachute and glass walk and fire walk and rock climb blindfolded and all of these things that we went through. Um, he was pretty influential in my life. Yeah, I, I still remember my first follow walk with Kirik on the Gold Coast. It was uh, it was a it was certainly a, a transformational moment. And so, mm. when did you retire? What year did you retire? Well, I went on to another three Olympics after that. I Kerry retired. Right. She did end up coming two thousand one two. She did come back. <laughs> so she came back, but at that point, I'd found a new volleyball partner and didn't. She did ask me, "Do you want to?" go play with me in Athens. Uh, and I said, no, because that kind of would be a last one and I've got a new partner and I don't want to piss her off. Um, and her name was Nicole. And so Nicole and I went to Athens. I had a shoulder, a different injury then, um, and we finished an athlete's worst nightmare, which is fourth, Oof. right? So yeah. you, you might, you know, you might as well come last because fourth is you play all the way through, you get nothing. You watch everyone else get their medals and you've missed all the parties. So not a good place. <laughs> um, so I played with Nicole. I then went on to another two with another partner, Tamsin. So I didn't yeah. retire till 2012. That's uh, a kind of Yeah, five Olympics. I was searching for that feeling again that yeah. happened in um, Sydney, but, you know, never got to those heights but had many of um, close – glimpses along the way and those other olympics that you just kind of well i just did another three or four olympics along the way. <laughs> well, you know i just you know uh, is there anything in there that really stands out for you as like as as pinnacle momentaries in your dialogue or your narrative that you know you still carry today yeah the the injury in athens was quite tragic i had had that um in January of 2004 and the Olympics was in August and I was told I needed a shoulder reconstruction, which takes 12 months. So I said no, because that would mean I'd miss the Olympics. So just just needle it with um, an injection. and But you couldn't keep doing that because they say you can only uh, put a corticosteroid and you do need a special form for your uh, drug testing and all of that. They say you can only use that sort of three or four times, otherwise the tendon starts to get too uh, weak. Mm. So I had had I had six-month preparation I needed to get through and th this is where you really understand your ego in check. My coach made Nicole and I go on tour and play against full attacking Brazilian, American, German teams and I had to play left-handed. Right, so I'm, I'm a right-hander, but the, he wanted us to get the experience of, of feeling like shit so that when we got to the Olympics, um, we would know what it would feel like and we wouldn't be doing that be for the first time. Yeah. 
So he and people are like, what are you doing here? We're like, we've got it all under control. We're getting smashed. <laughs> we, we are just getting pummeled. Now, now we then had to back off and try and build enough strength in it to get through so that the medics let you go because they shouldn't, in theory, they shouldn't have let me go. Right. Um, but, but we had to rebuild it enough to kind of fake it enough because we still believed we had a shot. Mm. Um, but I wasn't using my arm during that preparation. My, my doctor said, imagine you've got a, uh, a jar of Smarties or M&Ms and every time you swing at the ball, you're taking one out and we don't know how many are in the jar. Yeah, wow. And so you're oh, always on it on edge. Oh, that makes me feel ill. Oh, yeah. So that was really character building, and we <laughs> we sick. got all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I still do. Yeah. Oh, we got all the way through to the semi final. We made it to the semi final, and my biggest mistake in hindsight uh, was um, saving myself in the semi final because not knowing if there are any left in the jar. I mean, this is against one of the best teams in the world. Here I am thinking I can go 60% and make it to the final because I didn't want to get to the final and have to forfeit or play the, the final left-handed. I wanted to win that. Yeah. So we were we were underdone in the semi. We then came in the – we're in the bronze medal match and I gave it everything. I ripped the tendon off the shoulder. We didn't, we didn't quite get it. Mm. Um we had a shot. Looking back at the video, we had a shot. We took them to three sets because imagine your opposition now are shit scared because they should win. Mm. So now they're, they're doing things they've never done before. They're, they're serving the ball out. They're trying to – so we would we would change our game plan and we would do things never seen, like stand behind each other instead of side by side so that wherever the ball went, my partner Nicole could run and get it yeah, and I wow. wouldn't touch it. Yeah. Right, and so they're looking at this thing they've never seen before, which is partly why we practice some of it behind the curtain and in front of the curtain, um, so people would freak out. So that was a a big, a big time for me, and feeling not feeling the guilt for my volleyball partner Nicole, who had to to endure that. You know, she had yeah. to look after me, and and it was really it cost her a medal because we sh- we could have won the bronze. Um, yeah, big big time there. And then retirement comes in 2012. And at what point did you know you were going to hang up Wilson? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I I probably overstayed my welcome two or three years. Um, After Beijing. You're a fighter. You're a fighter. You you just don't know how to quit. I love it. And and my volleyball president said to me, like, why are you still here? Why don't you give the spot to someone else? (laughs) <laughs> that made it worse, dude. I'm like, now you've really poked yeah, the bear. Wow. Um, and he didn't think I was going to make it to five Olympics. They didn't want to give me any money. So there's, there's a whole financial story behind it, and you how much funding you get, and which, believe me, for most athletes is stuff all. Like we would get two thousand dollars a month, and they would hold that back. They're like, no. You're not living in Adelaide where the volleyball program was and we don't think you're going to make it anyway. I said, I've been to four Olympics, I've won two medals and you have the hide to stand there. I used a few more different words and we were really close to each other and I was like spitting at, there was no social distancing. And I was almost picking his nose with my finger, yelling at him going, how dare you, which which fueled the beasts, right? Yeah. So. We had gone from Athens where we came, not at Athens fourth, new partner, Beijing fifth. Um, so the slow decline back down the other side of the mountain. And then I said after Beijing 2008, I needed a rest. So I took a year off and my volleyball partner had a baby. So that was kind of aligned. And I said, let's see if we come back together and we'll see if we can make this work. So, you know, you sit down with a business plan and she said, okay, we'll give it a go, but I live in Melbourne and you live in Brisbane so that, and I'm not moving, she said. I said, okay, well, neither am I. So that's a long fucking way to hit the ball, but let's give it a shot. <laughs> uh, so I would train by myself and I would put a chair on the volleyball court and call the chair Tamsin and I'd be like yelling at the chair and moving around like the ball and the ball sort of 
it was a bit like virtual reality. <laughs> it's a bit weird. Um, and and after a year off, if I've got any advice to anyone thinking about having a year off, don't have like a half time break <laughs> because once just trying momentum. to restart. Oh yeah, my the god! Of, you... of stop is hard. Yeah. I suffered. I vomited for weeks, and I'm like, "Why am I? Am I doing? What am I doing this for? Is it my ego? Um, why? Why am I bothering?" And there was many answers to those questions. Partly is that's all I knew. My de- identity was wrapped up in it. I was afraid of what was next, even though I had set plans in place. But you still, your heart, your lungs, your your, your spirit is all attached to this journey of. Uh, five Olympic games. So um, I really, we, we came back together. We, we overcame a lot of our challenges and just enough to qualify. We were, we were in China as the last chance playing China in front of the 5,000 Chinese crowd and we had to win. And um, I mean, I could talk to you for an hour about that game, but that's the most poignant game in my career above the gold medal Why? being in a sit oh because everything if you imagine that guy off the green mile the movie when he's mm-hmm. spewing green stuff fly, that's yeah. when yeah when i won that game to qualify for my fifth olympics that was me on the ground like i was in exorcism i was like it just the pressure the um everything was if we were if we lost that match we were going home never to be seen again if we won we go to the olympics and we had we had a game plan. Oh, I remember this. You were like, <laughs> yes, yes, I remember this now. Carry on. <laughs> oh, so, so we have this game plan that had come from another team that had just beaten them. I mean, we should have beaten them on paper any given day, but when you add emotion to anything, let alone sport, it just changes the game, which is why the Olympics gives such an amazing X factor to performance. Um, so when you add that emotion, you add the pressure uh, and not to mention the fact that the game plan for the other team is a different dynamic. Why you would pick up anyone's business plan and and use it when it's not you, which is what we did. We're like, great, you just beat them. We're going to follow that plan. So for an hour, I followed that plan. I do exactly what, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen now. It's going to happen waiting for that opportunity. And with Three or four minutes to go, I said, this plan ain't fucking working, Tamsin. I said, we are changing. She said, no, stick to the plan. I said, no, it's not working. We're yelling at each other. And I know that in two or three minutes, it's that sliding doors moment. Life could be very different. So she says, no, we're sticking with the plan. She goes up to the net. She calls the play as the play we'd been doing for an hour that hasn't been working. And I'm like, switch, because you're eight metres apart, right? She says, no. I said, switch. She said, no. <laughs> and I'm like, in my head, I'm just like, fuck it. I've got, I'm doing it. I'm doing the opposite. So this is this is where Love you get you, that, you get your back yourself moment and yeah. you can't be half, couldn't be half pregnant at this stage. And in my head, I've gone, I'm fucking changing the plan. And I, st- I remember standing like in the position where I was supposed to be and kind of dropping a fake and bolting to the opposite place I was supposed to be. So when Tamsin turns around off the net, she's thinking I'm the other way, right? So I've got the ball. I'm like yelling at her going, oh, fuck, it's here. Oh, fuck, I told you to fucking change it. Here it is. And she's spun the opposite way and just like falling over herself. And I'm screaming at her to get up. And she ended up getting up. We won the point. It gave us a two-point lead. And we go on to win in two, two or three minutes later. And that, ha- you know what? That has never been spoken about, the fact that I went against the plan. She has never brought it up. Wow. It, wow. Yeah. How historic. But, but I feel it viscerally in my gut right now. You that, dropped to that- the floor from, the, from memory. When, this, when you guys won the point, you dropped down. It was like that moment where you said you were, I just remember you were like totally overcome. Paul, yeah, we'll it's a post. primitive we'll roll of this. Yeah, it was primitive, but I remember it being so real and so yeah. authentic, and it re- taking me back to you and going, "My gosh, there's Nat." You know, like, mm. like mm. it was raw. It was beautiful. It was it was very raw with, and, and that's a bit, you know, back then that was before social media. You don't mm. get to see. That's the only 
moment in time people see. And we were in China. No one saw it. I've got a few pictures of it. Um, there's video and, footage and people, there, right? Uh, there's probably What am I probably thinking of not. Then? No, hang on. What am I, I'm thinking of footage where – oh, it must have been when you won gold. I don't know. Probably I, when we won. Similar yeah. concept, right? Okay. And th- that that's the thing. We often have the same emotions, win, lose, or draw sometimes too. And um, it, it really – if I find it, I'll send it to you, and then you can Please. pop it up there we'll with the post. There. I'd, love to, I'd love to get get some B roll on that. Mm. So, yeah. um, at what point did you after this? Is it was this when you started really thinking about retirement seriously at this point? After because hang on, you came through, you won this game. What happened yeah. next? Let's finish this. Well, well, we go home. We literally our bags are packed, and right. I had said to Tam, I'd said to Tamsin, we go if whatever happens, we're going home, win, lose, or draw. Um, we're leaving because there was a chance to go and fly and play somewhere else. It wasn't going to happen. So we run straight back to the hotel, get on the plane, and just for that whole period of time, it's like we're going, I'm going to my fifth Olympics. We're going to the Olympics. We turn around and go to the Olympics, and the results are pretty bad. I'm not going to give you the unplugged version. I know you want it, but <laughs> it's not. Um, it's uh, It didn't go to plan. There are a few rules broken. and. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just hesitating on what we're well, supposed to. Here's the, the one rule that's broken: you're supposed to stay in the village. And Tamsin was there with her partner, her husband, and child. So you know, hence to say, many pillows placed in the doona right. um, to showcase Tamsin in the uh, in the village. But <laughs> that wasn't happening. So we, we didn't really do very well. We we played our three pool matches, so similar to football or soccer, and, and we lost all three and we were out. In golf, you'd call it a wash. Um, we didn't really have the performance we'd like, but my my Olympic performance was in definitely in China. Yeah, right. And uh, so I knew my last game was August 1st, 2012 at, at the steps so, of number 10 Downing Street. Just so we're clear, in terms of breaking the rules, the only rules that were broken were pillows placed under a pill, uh, under a, a doona to make it look like it was Tamsin in the village, right? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. That, that's the biggest rule, yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, hopefully there's Roll call. <laughs> Roll call. Hopefully enough time has passed now. She won't get in trouble for that. Um, yeah. So when was your last game? Say that again. August the 1st, 2012. Yep. Okay. And so did you know going into that game it was going to be your last one? Yep. I would uh, declared I was going to retire and that was the final um, – moment and so when did you the know international- in your head when did you know in your head you're like okay i need to i need to i need to hang up wilson what was that uh, in in that comeback from the year off and the momentum that right. it took and i'm like this is i'm done once i get to the top of this mountain again there's no um yeah the, the thing when you walk and i don't know if anyone's ever walked everest and i haven't but i imagine when you walk up everest and you get to the top you don't realize you've got to walk bloody back down the thing (laughs) right so so i always imagined walking up everest i got no problem but then getting helicoptered out except the 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 air's too thin so you i'm like what i gotta go down are you kidding me so that so that really is uh was the top so i got to the end of 2012 and so this is the end because of the climb i knew the climb was so tough and I had taken it for granted how I'd got to my first four Olympics and really the, the, the climb for the fifth was was what made me realise this. My mind was still like I still feel like an Olympic volleyballer in my head right now but physically and emotionally it's just too much. Yeah, right. And so when you started contemplating that, that transition, what did you see on the other side when you were still playing? Yeah, well, I'd sort of because we were in a low profile sport and we weren't and female female low profile sport there wasn't the money um to kind of uh, retire on so i had built a beach volleyball center at qe2 mount gravatt it seems to be you know back to the roots uh and and i thought my superannuation would come out of people paying 10 bucks a head to play social volleyball c grade kerwin i thought it was going to be that and i would run a beach beach volleyball center with ducks nuts and uh, I was also a professional speaker I did a lot of corporate speaking and that was going to be my retirement but um, running that business was a nightmare and uh, with staff and 
marketing and HR and legals and all those things you have to learn along the way uh, while I was playing and it was wow. probably too difficult while I was playing to, to do and the expectation was too high. So I used the volleyball centre as a training ground physically for myself and learned a lot of traditional business skill and uh, then when I retired I kind of – I clutched at everything, so I took on the president of the Queensland Olympic Council. I am, am on the board of the World Olympians Association. You know, do a charity, all these charities. You're like <gasps> significance. Got to have some kind of significance to try and build on. So, uh, no problem finding things to do, but whether they were paying me any money or um, purposeful yeah. was an, was another question. And so, how did you transition into into you know, post athlete life? What happened? Well, you're doing the speaking gigs. A, you had the you had the beach volleyball center. What happens next? You, well, uh, my wife gets pregnant. Yep. <laughs> Which is only and, like uh, how long ago now? Uh, well, she's four. Jordan's four. four. Okay. Yep. So that's uh, 2016. Yeah. Wow. 15 October 15. She was born. I retired in. 12 so we you know it took a while with two females it's a bit harder than than the, <laughs> than the average, average, bear. The average formula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so that took a bit of planning that was a bit more challenging and um sort of i knew that something had to go in the schedule i'd put in place with the, so i chose um to get rid of the business and uh, we had come across a network marketing company at the time that that had started to be fruitful for us in the nutrition space. So we started to grow that and um, it's been a great opportunity to transition. That has mm. been helpful as well as the corporate speaking. And then I took on board roles and- Because you're still um, quite active in the, uh, in, the, in the athlete community. I know you're always lobbying for yeah, more, more things for athletes, better treatment for athletes. Tell us about the work that you're doing there. Yeah, well then just recently this year, it, um, 2020 uh, as my 20 year reunion of the medal I thought I better grow up and get a real job <laughs> it's my only you know it's my only job I've ever had I've been entrepreneurial and had an yeah. entrepreneurial spirit um, for for my whole life and and then I got a I took a job with government so the Queensland government uh, around elite success and partnerships with the vision of 2032 and the Olympics coming to Brisbane mm. which even though we're in, um, you know, the year of 2020, and there's a, a challenge with the coronavirus, there is. Once we get out of this, there is definitely a um, a desire for Queensland to host an Olympic Games in 2032. So, I've sort of taken on that role, and right now we're we're in a a response stage to help our athletes and mm. sports, but. That's the focus moving forward. And I could, if anyone, and this is a beautiful thing about this, what you just said, this whole scenario, if anyone could get the Olympics to Brisbane, <laughs> look at you. I just love it. You look, you've still got the t-shirt on. You are the fucking, totally. you're like the Steve, you're like the Steve Irwin of, uh, of athletes in Australia. So what is, and that you actually brought up a really interesting, because I've talked to a lot of business owners in the last couple of weeks about, you know, their business response plan, their business contingency mm. plan to COVID. Uh, I'm curious about the response plan for athletes because a lot of these athletes, you know, they do depend on, you know, uh, I guess you could say either, you know, government programs, scholarships, sponsorships. What's what's happening with the athletes? Yeah, it, it's really tough. So that if any of them were winning prize money, they can't because the events have stopped. So first, their events have stopped. Second, um, if they had casual work, that's stopped. Yeah. Uh, third, if they were getting um, sponsorship, then the sponsors are reviewing contracts so that they don't have to pay out because ultimately the Olympics has been moved to 2021. Um, it will still be called 20, Tokyo 2020 and uh, it, will, it will go on in July of 2021. So the sponsors will still want to do their activations but they're going to move them and they yeah. won't want to pay for an extra year. So yeah. all, all of that is going on right now. So the Queensland government are looking at a package to help the athletes, um, and yeah, I can't, we haven't announced that yet. So uh, the athletes and the sports, our sports clubs, you know, how do we keep them um, afloat? And yeah, it, it's a, it's a, I mean, everywhere, business, yeah. small business, yeah. entrepreneurs, because the entrepreneur, right? What do you when 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 you're on this curve and exponential growth, you're trying to build, and um, you often get part paid the 
the last on the list, if at all, uh, it really isn't isn't a fun place right now. So it's interesting because we, we, I, I think we're going to see a lot of shifts in a whole range of different industries. You know, we're going to see shifts in business, um, you know, traditional business. We're going to see you know shifts in employment, um, also in the property market. You know, the share market. We're seeing shifts, right? And I'm curious if this is in itself going to create its own shift, whereby I can only imagine this has the potential to take an entire uh, segment of athletes out of competition, um, not just temporarily, but potentially long term. Because being an athlete, it requires funding. You know, you need to be able to, you know, eat, feed, sleep, and train, and get the best advice. So, do you potentially see there being, you know, uh, a, a, a shift in uh, perhaps a, a lost generation of athletes? That, and again, a generation. It's only fucking six months, ago and everyone just chill out. <laughs> For a second, but 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 when you think about it, you know, sports is a generational sport. You know, you've been around now for you know generations essentially, and so do you see this potentially having generational impact on on sports? I think it will. I think depending on the stage, we've got athletes that they were counting the days to retirement and now have to hang oh, on another year. Fuck. You know, so I can't imagine if that um, – Especially and, if you're holding then, an injury. Can you imagine? Like, oh. Yeah. And then you've got first-timers <laughs> that are actually going, oh, this could be great because I'll be a bit stronger and a bit, um, yeah. bit more mature. And So much balance. Uh, and it's the spectrum, right? It's mm. like life, the cycle of life, you, our sports, how they recover from this and whether you see some sports um, fold. Uh, will, will be interesting and have you got any predictions it, it def- there in, in terms of different codes uh, like i know it's hard you're 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 in the volleyball space but we're all seeing what's yeah. going on in the different codes now and it is interesting to yeah, see yeah ironically you see a different uh, the bigger codes are the ones under more pressure because mm. they they underpin the sports sector you know they mm. employ lots of people there's broadcasting which is why you're seeing the rugby league trying to get back on tv and and all of those uh, uh, netball too, their the membership fees and everything going on, it underpins the sector versus some of the smaller sports just might put the gone fishing sign up, right? Just, oh, well, we'll just shut the door and we'll go fishing and we'll come back. Might not be as impacted. You might see the, the middle tier that are a little bit more reliant on um, the membership and the government funding that might struggle. Mm. But I think... I'm hopeful that the collective of the sports industries, and that's why the Olympics is so good, because the Olympics represents a whole sector of 26 to 31 sports on any given Olympics. The power is in the collective. Yeah. So if we if we can keep that collective strong and make sure we don't clamour over the top of each other, mm, we got so... we're we're all in this together, um, and we've got to do this together. And that's such a important important thing to to really yeah I think I couldn't think of a better way to to finish the interview than yeah we've got to work together through this sectors mm. need to come together people need to come together communities families yeah people who perhaps wouldn't normally get together maybe we're going to see federations of sport come together that we've never seen come together before maybe we're going to mm-hmm. see new introductions of sports to the Olympics that we've never seen before because you know of what we're seeing right now so yeah there's I guess there's a whole lot of potential. You've worked with some of the best coaches in the world, not just sports coaches, performance coaches, performance psychologists. Um, you also work now as, in many respects as a coach yourself. Um, I'm curious to know, like, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received under, for a situation where you're under immense pressure? Like shit's going south, you know, you're, you're behind, it looks like you're not going to win, whatever. You've got sand in your eye. Your G-string's not just sitting right on your bikini. <laughs> What what is your go to piece of advice or psychological hack that you use to perform when under pressure mm. and you don't feel like you've got your head straight at that moment? Well, the best thing in beach volleyball used to be the timeout. You just yeah, yeah you taught about momentum of sport and the timeout and and how that saves you. So sometimes though you run out of those, and so then you get on Ooh. a time. How, how do you? save time or how do you create an illegal timeout because that the referees are all over you and fixing the line and the sand and yeah I've got sand in my pants and everywhere yeah um but the, but they get on top of that right so my coach used to say his line was composure under pressure and then if you think about how you bring composure it's through breath it's through centering it it's through finding your own space between your ears because the pressure we create is often always self-imposed. 
always, um, not really often. It's the perception or the interpretation we give to the scenario in front of us. So how do we create a new scenario that releases the pressure and almost like lets the air out of the balloon, right? So you no longer have that pressure. So composure under pressure. And one of the best ways to describe that is as well is imagine climbing up a ladder and a cyclone hits. You've got to hang on to the – in the biggest pressure moments, hang on to that rung in the ladder that you're on, which is a good time for right now. Don't try and climb through this unless you're in a good position to climb. Hold on, weather the storm, wait for a break in the clouds and take another little step, climb up the ladder. And that's really how we best handled it. Mm. I remember watching Wimbledon once and the commentator, I, th- I can't remember, I remember it was Serena Will- Williams was playing, it was the finals. Uh, it was She was behind and, that, and one of the commentators said, oh, you can just feel the tension in centre court here today. The pressure is enormous. The pressure on Serena is just incredible. And then the other commentator said, well, that's the thing, Gerald. He said, pressure to a champion isn't pressure. It's just merely another opportunity to perform. And I'm curious from your perspective, have you had to learn how to, in those moments where the pressure's there and you don't have that opportunity to time it out, you don't have that opportunity to breathe it out. Have you in turn learned how to use that efficiently and effectively, almost like channeling as you would an emotion to be able to perform at a high level with coherence? Yeah, well, that's what the experience and the training does Mm. enable you to perform at that high level some people and young athletes think they have to wait for the fear to go away or they have Mm. to wait for that pressure to dissipate. You can perform anyway and and it's how you train yourself to do that. So often, like the the last, when I commentate um, on the gold medal match to my friends, (laughs) <laughs> well, we, we and we don't. I don't do it often, but we play. We play the match, and I commentate on what the, is really going on, right? And Karen and I often laugh. Of when you're standing there trying to compose yourself, and we learn about posture. Hold your posture. Fake it till you make it. Stand strong. Breathe, and look to your opposition like you've got your shit together. Really, we didn't. I'm standing there in the last match going, for God's sake, serve the ball to her so I don't screw it up. <laughs> and she's, try- she's trying to do the same thing. So that's what's going on. It's like you're trained to not focus on the don't. Don't think about the pink elephant. But all that was going through my head was don't fuck it up. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> don't fuck it up. And you're like shaking and you're trying not to shake. So a- absolutely, you learn through the experience of the of that and you learn through saying that your opposition's going through it too. Take a big breath and this is what you've trained for and this is what it's all about and love the pressure and all that shit you tell yourself so that you hope you pull it off. Do you know what I'd love to see and I reckon you should do it? You should do um, um, all of your top matches and do it on like film but you should do a director's cut voiceover where you should commentate. No, for real. That would actually be good so yeah, yeah. content. Commentate yeah, yeah. You know, your 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 most um, profound matches. I, I would fucking watch that in a heartbeat now. I'd love to sit down and watch <laughs> a, a gold medal match and have you commentate it. So if there's someone out there right now um, who did need a, a little bit of a lift, like what would you say to them? Like what's, what's the, your advice that you give others when they come to you? Because you've, you've explained what you do, but what do you tell mm. others to do in situations where they're, they're, they're not sure what to do or they're feeling the pressure? Well, and I've got a few I'm mentoring for the Olympics, so it's it's probably um, a, a good chance to give that information out. It really is about um, sit in the corner and cry. Have you cry, right? Yeah. Release that. Yeah. Release that emotion. Scream, yell, um, yeah, get it out, and and then be compassionate. Be compassionate to yourself. Be compassionate to others, and find time to like almost fill your cup, whatever that, and we right now we can't leave the house right now um, unless you're exercising. So I encourage you to exercise, encourage you to move your body, encourage you to uh, breathe in the sunshine. So go and stand in the driveway um, and breathe it in. So fill yourself with that compassion and it's hard to do. Like it sounds you know, you could put it on step one, scream and cry. Step two, 
um, be compassionate to self and others, but that's a practice. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and I know you talk about meditation. Find a meditation practice even if you suck at it. You don't have to be perfect at it. Do it for one minute, two minutes, five minutes a day. And really just that's how you bring the calm. In the chaos, you have to bring calm through exercise, a swim in your backyard if you've got a pool, um, sunshine on your body, um, close your eyes and imagine being hugged by all your best friends. And that resets you to a point where you can actually make a clearer decision mm. or a clearer action. Mm. And and you just and you might have to do that ten times a day. Yeah. Really. Because it's not once and that's it. I'm sorted. Yeah. Got my shit sorted. It's all the time. Mm. All the time. Work is like nutrition. If you don't stop. <laughs> Otherwise you starve. You gotta keep doing the work. <laughs> Otherwise Yeah. It we know And what. I and I I learned that, you know, Ko and I, um, people think that I still work out a lot and I have not worked out more than in this lockdown because I can roll out of bed and do Zoom on the floor with my trainer, Zoom training. Um, but I had a good six or seven years where I didn't want to exercise. Mm. I felt like yeah. um, it was a, a bit of PTSD and I, I didn't want to go near a gym. It smelt bad. I, I The pain, the feeling of someone yelling at me as, you know, and, and I've really realized that it is so important for your mental health to move because mm. it gets rid of the stagnation. Mm. It really does shift that energy mm. through the body. And um, if you haven't exercised or you've been wanting to, now is a good time to, to start moving your body. Ladies and gentlemen, Natalie Cook, thank you so much, Natalie, for being on Unstoppable. <laughs> I love you to death. It's such a pleasure. As I said, the only thing I didn't have with you is my first kiss. First skydive, first walk, <laughs> first five walk, not my first kiss. Natalie, thank you so much for being on. Hey, by the way, before you go, like if people want to find out more about Natalie, like where can they go? And when's the book coming? Oh, well, I've got one book that talks about the gold medal. So that's right. called Go Girl. Go and girl. that's been around since 2001 and boys well, can read it too. And, yeah, go girl and it's the story reset. of – this. that's all right, Kurt. <laughs> it's the story of – been pulled off the shelves it's in my garage um it's a story of bronze to gold and yep. i literally am this year uh in the process of writing my book on the 20 to release for the 20 year anniversary so that's a bit of a nice. secret out of the bag so um nataliecook.com all the socials i'm the best at facebook but uh and then I was told that only old people are on Facebook and I needed to be on Instagram and then I need to be TikTok. I don't know how you do it. My hat goes off to you. You're the man. I, I, let me tell you, it's a good team. It's a good team. I tried to do it all myself for the first 18 months, almost killed me. Let me tell you right now. <laughs> it's a lot. But ladies and well, gentlemen. Well, it's been, it's been fun watching you grow too. I'm oh, so excited no. to call you my friend. And, ditto. Uh, ditto, ditto, and, ditto. Uh, we, we can be parents together and and. and grow our little humans indeed give my love to jordan we'll speak soon and to noah too see ya bye doll this episode was brought to you by nail it and scale it the world's leading fast growth program for business there you have it guys thanks for tuning in to unstoppable with me your host Kerwin ray and please do not forget to subscribe to our youtube channel where you get to see all of these interviews in the, the flesh share this podcast with your friends and drop me a review on itunes i would love to hear what you guys think and also let you know that your comments help make sure that we keep producing killer content just like this and if you'd like to stay up to date with all of my movements upcoming podcasts events and much more please jump onto the website kerwinray.com and also check us out on all social media on the handle at kerwinray thanks for joining us